The topic is, how long does it take to be saved? We're going to talk about forgiveness, and then we're going to talk about putting the pieces back together. For a little while today, at the start of this talk, I want to talk about the S word. The S word is a word that we do not normally like to use. Billy Graham, who has a great sense of humor, tells the story of a lady who went to church on a Sunday morning. Husband didn't go with her. And when the lady got home, the husband said, what did the preacher talk about? She said, today he spoke about sin. The husband said, what did he say about sin? The lady replied, he was against it. <laughs> sin has become somewhat a vague definition. Some psychologists say do not use the word sin because it gives us bad vibes and they refer to it as negative action. Others have said don't tell people they're sinners because this will make them feel bad about themselves. One famous preacher and he is famous and I'm sure a very wonderful man went through the hymn book of his denomination and found every reference to sin and sinners and had it deleted. He said we should not tell people about sin or else they may do it. The Bible teaches that sin must be dealt with because sin is an intruder that robs us of joy, peace, good times, and brings death. And the Bible teaches as plain as day that every person here, including the preacher, is infected and affected by sin. There are no exceptions. I would like you to take your Bible and turn to the book of Romans chapter 5 and verse 12 for a start. The book of Romans written by the great Apostle Paul. The Romans, the fifth chapter, and we are going to notice verse 12, and you'll find Bibles in the pews. And I would like you to follow me, if you will, today. You'll be much blessed if you will turn to the text of the Holy Word. Jesus said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Romans 5, verse 12, from the book of Romans the Tyndale described as good, glad, and merry tidings that makes a man's heart to sing for joy and his feet to, to dance. It is the book on salvation. Therefore, verse 12, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all men because all sinned. The Bible teaches that the sin of Adam brought death into the whole world, and the Bible teaches that the sin of Adam has infected every one of us. We are infected with sin from the moment we are conceived. And we are affected by sin. I want you to notice verse 19 of the same chapter. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. The Bible teaches this doctrine which is a difficult doctrine for the 20th century man to believe. It teaches the universality of sin and the Bible says that we are all born in a state of sin. David in the famous psalm of repentance after his sin with Bathsheba and after the, the death of the baby and the death of Uriah said I was born in sin and in sin did my mother conceive me. And so David recognized the fact that we are sinners from birth. Jesus said in one of the Gospels, Mark chapter 7, For out of the human mind come evil thoughts. We are tempted not only from without, but we are tempted from within because we are born in a state of sin. So every person here today is a sinner, I am a sinner, and we stand in need of salvation. We are also sinners because of our own personal decisions. I can say, Adam caused all of this. It is not my fault. I am not to blame. But the Bible teaches that we have all personally chosen to sin. The Bible says that sin is the transgression of the law. And not only are we born in a state of sin with tendencies to sin, 
But the Bible tells me that every one of us has willfully chosen to break the holy law of God. And the evidence of man's sinfulness is everywhere apparent. It is seen in violence. We are filled with violence. Our society, even our homes, are filled with violence. Hate, greed, lying, racism, black on white, white on black, black on brown, brown on white, and you can go through the whole gamut. The human heart basically is racist because it is filled with pride. Another form of sin is stealing. Have you heard the story of the man who worked at General Motors in Detroit and every day he walked through the gate pushing a wheelbarrow and they could not figure out what he was stealing and each time the guards would stop him and they would search him and they took the wheel off the wheelbarrow and looked inside the wheel. Every day he came through the gate pushing a wheelbarrow. He had them completely baffled until they discovered that he was stealing wheelbarrows. <laughs> the Bible teaches that man has sinned and we have all been stealing wheelbarrows. The worst sin is not the sin of the flesh, Jesus said. Jesus said that the worst sin was the sin of the churchgoer, self-righteousness. The worst sin is not adultery and it is not the sin of homosexuality. I read from one leading theologian this week who said this, and this is a hard saying, who will hear it? He said, our pride is worse than the sin of homosexuality. Jesus said, so if a person is smitten with pride, particularly spiritually proud, there is more hope for a professing, acting homosexual than for that man who stands in the pulpit if his life is controlled by pride. And while we will throw people out of the church because of immorality, we ordain them and make them preachers for pride. And pride is the worst of sins. Jesus said, the fornicators, the adulterers, and the harlots go into the kingdom of God ahead of the religious people. Pharisaism is the worst of sins because it sees no need. Pharisaism says, I am righteous, I am a good person, I do not need to confess my sins. I remember an elder of one of our churches in Texas said to me, and she was a very good person, the very best, she said, I have a problem when I come to the time of confession of my sin because of, I can't think of any that I have done. This is the most incurable of all diseases. It is the doctrine also of sinless perfectionism where people become so deluded in their sins that they think that they are no longer sinful and they no longer need a savior. But the Bible teaches us, listen to these words, the Bible says, there is none righteous, no, not one, there is not a righteous person in this church. There is none righteous, no, not one. The Bible says, all have sinned, Romans chapter 3, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. When it says, all have sinned, it is talking past tense, and that is all right, because we can say, this is our past. But the Bible says all have sinned and fall short, which is continuous. The Bible says that every one of us is falling short of the glory of God. And the Bible teaches that every man needs a Savior. How long does it take to be saved? I don't know if they have these little creatures in America, but in Australia we have what they call ant lines. And in the sand they will make something like an inverted pyramid or a cone in the sand. And an ant comes along and he falls into it and he can never get out. He tries to climb up the sides, but he can't get up the sides because it is too steep. And the ant line is below waiting for him to become exhausted. The ant line is like a little dragon. I delighted in picking ants out of those pits. And what we need, my friend, is somebody bigger and somebody from above to lift us out. And the Bible tells us all have sinned. You have sinned. I have sinned. We have broken the holy law of God 
But the Bible tells us that there is good news and that is what the gospel is. The Bible tells us that there is someone bigger than we are and somebody from above who has come down to this earth and paid the price for our sins and who wants to stoop over and lift us out of the pit of sin. How does it really work? How does it work for a doctor here in Los Angeles? How does it work for a psychologist? How does it work for a pastor? How does it work for a housewife? How does it work for a secretary? How does it work for the heralds? How does it work for, for me? How long does it take to be saved? How can I be saved? I want to take today a number of stories from the life of Jesus. And I want you to notice these stories because these stories illustrate how God lifts us out of the pit of sin and makes us into new people, and then he picks up the pieces. Would you please come to Luke 18, verses 9 to 14. This is the first story that our Lord tells, that I'm going to use at least. Luke chapter 18, and verse 9 and onwards. Dear hearts and gentle people, please turn to the passage if you don't mind. Luke chapter 18, verse 9 and onwards. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else. Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this man from the IRS. I, they're talking about a flat tax to get rid of this. Mm. Let me not get onto that one. Evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home, what is the word? Say it again. Justified before God, for everyone who exalts himself will be humble, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. There is justification for the humble. There is justification for the person who says, Lord, have mercy upon me, a sinner. This word justified is a word that is tremendously important. Listen carefully. This is tremendously important. If you do not understand this truth, you may miss the door to heaven. The word justified does not mean to make righteous. Let me say that again. Justify does not mean to make righteous. It is a declaration of a judge who says, I declare that you are righteous, even though you are a sinner. Did you hear this? The Bible tells me in Romans that God justifies the ungodly. If we had written that text, we would say that God justifies the godly. But the Bible says that God justifies the ungodly. And justification, let me give you this theology. The word justify is the Greek word that means to declare righteous. And this tax collector, even with all his faults and his failings, went back to his home, declared righteous by the God of heaven, and he was saved in that moment. How long did it take the tax collector to get saved? The time it took him to lift up his eyes and say, Lord, have mercy upon me, a sinner. There is justification. There is salvation. There is mercy for the person who sees his need and who cries out for mercy from God. Do you want to be saved in this moment? I meet all sorts of Christians who say, well, one day we're going to be good enough to go to heaven. Friend, that day will never come. People say, I'm getting ready for Jesus when he's going to come. I'm not getting ready, my friend. We should not be getting ready. We ought to be ready today and stay ready. Amen. And justification lifts me out of the pit of sin, so I stand in the sight of a holy God, ready now, justified, declared righteous, 
Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So that's the first story, and the second story is one of my favorites. It's the story of the two sinners. Luke 7, verse 36. There is a power in the Word of God if you and I will only get it open. God never gave us Bibles to sit on the, the shelves. They don't do any good there. Luke 7, verse 36 and onwards, dear hearts and gentle people. This is one of the great, marvelous, wonderful stories of the Bible. You got the text? Hmm. Now, one of the Pharisees. You can't read the New Testament without running into the Pharisees. The story of Jesus and his miracles and everything about him is in the context of the super-religious humbugs, the Pharisees. Now, one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. So he went to the Pharisee's house and inclined at the table. When a woman who had lived a sinful life in that town learned that Jesus, she wasn't invited, learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster jar of perfume, and as she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. Of course, some would say she'd gone across the boundary of decorum. Uh, he was a lady who had a reputation in the town because she was a prostitute. But Jesus had met her. And when Jesus meets somebody, it's never the same. And so she comes in and she takes down her hair, which was almost a provocative thing to do. She took down her hair and she covered his feet with kisses and then she wiped his feet with her hair. And the Pharisee who knew her only too well watched her and watched Jesus and the pride rankled in his heart. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, this man were a prophet. He would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that he is a sinner. He was an authority on that subject. He knew. Simon the Pharisee knew that she was a sinner and he knew her in the biblical sense. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. <laughs> Can you imagine, Simon? We have evidence that Simon had slept with her and here is the old Pharisee thinking in his heart, Jesus is not a prophet because he would know. And then Jesus reads his mind. Jesus reads our minds. He knows what you're thinking now, whether you like the sermon or not. <laughs> so Jesus knew what the Pharisee was thinking, and he said, Simon, I have something to say to you. Can you imagine the flush coming up Simon's neck? What's he going to say? Is he going to name the places? But Jesus did not bring even to Pharisees public humiliation because Jesus believed in grace. It would be wonderful if his disciples treated people as Jesus did in grace. I have gone to some countries where if a girl has got pregnant out of wedlock, they bring her down on the front of the church where she is questioned by the elders in front of the congregation as a sign of piety. Not piety, but evilness in their hearts. That's what it is. Some of you may know the country I'm talking about. For a good offering, I'll tell you. <laughs> Jesus answers, Simon, I have something to tell you. <laughs> tell me, teacher, he said. Two men owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back. Remember that. Neither of them had the money to pay him back. So he canceled the debts of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon replied, 
I suppose the one who had the bigger debt canceled. You've judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned towards the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not, did not give me any water for my feet. But she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not pour, pour oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who has been forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. And verse 50, Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. When, she, when was she saved? At that moment, she was saved. A prostitute, she was saved. Now we get this story upside down because Jesus said, the person who's had the most sins forgiven is the person who loves the most. And we say, well, she had the most sins to be forgiven. That's why she loved the most. And Simon only had one or two. That's why only loved a little. That's not right. That's not right. She had many sins. And Jesus forgave them. And she loved much. Simon was the greatest sinner and had never fallen on his knees and prayed, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Therefore, he was not justified. He was condemned. And that's why he had no love. Would you like to know why people are so rough on people, particularly in certain churches. I can tell you about some churches where they devour each other, they gossip, they criticize, all in the name of Jesus. It is because they are Pharisees and they've never seen themselves as lost sinners in need of the mercy of God. But a person who has been forgiven will be forgiving. If you can't forgive people, it is probably because you've never accepted forgiveness and you are in a lost condition. Only a forgiven person can extend forgiveness. And when God gives me forgiveness, He says, I am justified and I am saved then. Amen. This lady was saved. What about Simon? Simon. There is some evidence that the Lord got to that tough old Pharisee's heart and he was saved too later on. God even has mercy for the religious. God even will show mercy to churchgoers as well as prostitutes, even though it is more difficult for him. The greatest of all sins is self-righteousness. This act of forgiveness releases power, releases a flood of healing energy, reconciliation, peace, a clear conscience, love towards others, tolerance of the faults of others. I won't be getting after you for your faults when I know my own and God has forgiven me. The person in the church who wants to set every person right is the person who's never seen himself. And this is where healing begins. Dr. Rose Peters, one of my wonderful church members, is a great psychiatrist and does a tremendous amount of good because she believes in the gospel. I was reading some time ago about a psychologist who had treated a male patient for several years who had every type of psychological disorder. And this man came to a Bible meeting and he heard the story of the gospel. And in that meeting, he turned to God and he poured out, not in public, and he poured out in the privacy of his own home all of his hates, all of his fears. He poured it all out and it came out with gushing tears and he accepted the mercy of God and was healed. Became a new person with a new mind and a new attitude. I'm saved when I come to Jesus. I'm forgiven. I'm justified. I'm declared righteous. 
But then God starts to put back the pieces. In a sense, he puts all the pieces back when I'm justified, I'm declared righteous. But I'm still me, and me needs a lot of attention. A friend of mine, Pastor Ted Oliver, used to work in a psychiatric ward and became a member of my evangelistic team in Australia. His past experience was a help to him. And uh, <laughs> I know it's a little subtle, folks. Don't worry. You can get the tape and play it back. I was talking to Ted, and we were talking about mental problems, and he said, well, no one is 100%. He said, the best of us aren't 100%. We are all wounded soldiers. My father used to work at the Can Cross Dry Dock on the Brisbane River in Australia. As a wee little boy, I would go out and see ships in various stages of repair. We are all in various stages of repair. We're in the dock. We are safe because of the blood of Christ, safe because of justification. We are safe, but we are not sound. None of us, as Ted said, are 100%. Let me talk now about what the theologians love to call sanctification. We're going to talk now for a few minutes about putting back the pieces, and I want to take some other stories out of the Bible. I want you to think of the day when Jesus died. When Jesus was hanging on the cross and there beside him were two thieves uh, who were cursing and swearing unregenerate sinners. And then one looked at Jesus and the Spirit of God spoke to his heart and he turned to Jesus and he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus said, yes, you're going to be in the kingdom of God. When was he saved? Right at that moment. He was saved at that moment. He was justified. But I want to tell you that God even went further. God took a man who was a cursing blasphemer and he turned him into a worshipping child of God ready for the kingdom. When all the world saw Jesus as a fraud, this man called him Lord. In the last hours of his life, he put back the pieces. It doesn't have to take a million years. It is, one author said, it's the work of a lifetime, but he only had a short lifetime. God put back the pieces. You know the story, now we, that's a story of a bad man. Now we're going to talk about a good man, a Christian, a disciple whose name was Peter. And you know the story of Peter? And Peter said, even though everybody else denies you, I won't. And then the devil got to his heart through the slip of a girl. And Peter denied the Lord with cursing and swearing. It is believed by most Christians that Peter at that stage was unconverted. I do not believe it. The text is used when you are converted, strengthen your brethren. The Greek says, when you turn again not converted. But did you know that in John chapter 13, when Jesus is washing their feet, he turns to the disciples and says, you are all clean except for one. Were they ready to die, those disciples? Were they ready to die, those 11 disciples? Yes. If Jesus says you are clean, then you are clean. They were clean. They were justified. They were saved by the grace of God, but they still had some work to be done in their souls. But they were saved. And even saved men and women can make mistakes. Oh, people say, but that is not so. If you're a Christian, you don't make any mistakes. Peter was a Christian, but he was a man who took his eyes off the Lord like we do a lot of the time. Then you come to the Gospel of John after the resurrection, and Jesus is by the sea, and he's cooking a breakfast of fish and bread. Just let that sink in. 
He's cooking a breakfast of fish and bread. And Peter had said, I'm fed up with everything. Let's go fishing. And so they go fishing and they don't catch a, a thing. And then in the morning, Jesus says, put the net on the other side. And Peter sees it's the Lord. And he plunges over the side and he swims to the shore and Jesus has just cooked up some fish and some bread and he says to Peter and the rest of the disciples this is what it says come and have breakfast and then he restores Peter do you love me Peter do you love me Peter do you love me and then he says the day is going to come Peter when they're going to carry you where you don't want to go he restored Peter to the inner circle. God can take all of us as believers who make mistakes and restore us also. He can put back the pieces. Who doesn't need to have some pieces put back? I do. What about you? Then, of course, there was Mary, who'd been the prostitute, who'd been wronged by a church official. But she was at the cross, and then at the tomb, not a perfect person in herself, but saved and in love with Jesus. God took Mary and put back the pieces. He can do it for you. We call that little bit there, that sanctification. After you are saved, then he works on us. I guess... One of my favorite stories in the Bible that you know off by heart, at least, I think you do, is the story of the lady who's had the bleeding issue, what was it, 12 years? And Jesus has come to town. There's a great big crowd of people and she's tried every doctor. and They haven't helped. And as Jesus goes by, she reaches out and she touches him. And Jesus turns around and says, who touched me? The disciples laughed. They said, there are so many here. But Jesus said, I perceive that virtue has gone out of me. You know this? Jesus can tell the difference between the brush of an idle hand and the touch of faith. He can see a lonely woman in a great crowd and he can tell the difference. And he turned around and he said, your faith has saved you. She was saved when she touched him. Some of you have heard of Dr. Peter Marshall, a Scotsman, on occasions wore a kilt, spoke with a wonderful lilt in his voice. I think he became the chaplain of the Senate of Congress, died as a young man preaching the gospel. Few could preach Christ like Dr. Peter Marshall. And he preached a sermon on this woman who touched Jesus. When I was a boy trying to become a minister and had no sermons, I memorized his sermons and preached them. And I can remember the conclusion of Dr. Peter Marshall's sermon on the woman with the bleeding issue. Dr. Peter Marshall said to the Presbyterian Church, of which he was the first pastor, he said, reach out your faith and touch him. Your trembling fingers may reach him as he passes. Reach out your faith, touch him. He will not turn round and say, who touched? He will know. And if you reach out the trembling finger of faith today, he will not say to you, who touched me? He will know. And in that moment, you will be saved. If you will reach out the trembling finger of faith today because of his blood that he shed for you. 
you believe today, in this moment, you will be saved now, in this moment. Please bow your heads. Precious Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for his love. We thank you for the great truth of forgiveness and justification that God doesn't treat us as we deserve, but he treats us as his son deserves. Our Father, today, as Jesus is here, we would reach out the trembling hand of faith and we would touch him. We thank you it is the touch of faith because of the merits of the Savior that brings healing and salvation in a moment of time. As we're praying today with our heads bowed, with our eyes closed in the presence of God the Father Almighty, in the presence of the holy angels, how many in this audience today, in this church, will reach out a hand and say, I want to touch Jesus today, I would be whole today. I would be saved in this moment. Lift up your hand if you can say it. Lift up your hand high. Say, Lord, I would be saved today. Let every hand be raised for the glory of Jesus if it's in your heart today. See, some of you got two hands up. Bless you. Bless you. Dear Father, look at these hands today. Keep them up. Look at these hands. Bless them, dear Father. May they hear the Lord Jesus say to them today, your faith has made you whole. Go in peace. Amen and amen.